So Lisa, here we are, yes. sitting down, having a chat, socially distanced. I'm scared. <laughs> don't be scared, don't My be scared. My are clammy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think mm. the best place to start, we all know, you know, at, now at this stage, we know who you are, we know your music, you've been on every stage and every time in every part of the country, yeah. I think at this point in your career. Um, but you did turn 30 a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And these milestones in life give us a time to take a step back and maybe just work out what we're doing, what we've done, where we're going. How yeah. did your approach turn in 30? Um, for me, it was it was a big deal actually turning 30 and probably a bigger deal now than I, when I look back on it than I actually maybe um, let known, to mm -hmm. be honest. Uh, I think... You know, when you're in your early teens and your twenties, you're you're not really sure who you are. You're you're kind of finding your feet. You're out partying. You're having a ball, and you're you're enjoying life. And then I think when you come to thirty, it's almost like a bit of a shift. Um, you know, you think about up ahead. Well, I know I I did anyway, and what life is going to be like in the future. Um, and instead of just planning for Saturday night out, I was kind of conscious of you know, what I really wanted to do with, especially the next 10 years in, in between my 30s and 40s. You know, I, I want to have a family. I want to, you know, have a more of a settled life um, and just do more of things that please me and instead of me pleasing everyone else. I think I am very guilty of not being able to say the word no and up until that point, I think I was very, not conscious, but I I wouldn't have handled as well as I probably would now someone saying that they weren't overly keen on something I was doing or um, I would very much take everyone else's opinions on board and, and feel like I had to do something a certain way instead of just being fully, truly to myself or true mm -hmm. to myself. So I suppose I kind of maybe grew a bit of a backbone turning 30 and, and thought I'm going to do what, what I want to do now. Was there a fear of being critiqued before then? A fear of, um, I suppose, just like you said, you were people pleasing, were you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I suppose everyone is guilty to, to a certain extent for that. No one wants to be told, you know, you're not going to do this or I don't think, you know, I enjoyed you doing this or... and. Up until that point, I was just, I just had all these dreams I wanted to achieve. And I was just a young girl who was trying to find her way. And so you listen to everyone's opinion and you try and if that's going to help you benefit your career and your mm -hmm. life and get you or get you closer to where you want to be, then you take that on board. And if someone like a radio presenter says you should be singing this song or release this song or I'll play this song for a year or a promoter says you should be doing these shows or, you know, our management team or booking agency, you should be doing this in your, your shows, you listen and, you know, you're okay, well, if you think that's right, then 100% I'll go for it. Now, I'm not saying I wasn't happy with that. Absolutely, you have mm -hmm. to be. Um, but I think now I've realised, yes, I want to benefit my career and I want to, you know, achieve all those goals and aspirations. But I want to also be 100% me. Um, and I, I'm, I realise I'm not going to be everyone's cup of tea. No one is. Mm -hmm. But I'm comfortable with that now. You're comfortable putting yourself out there in a different yeah. way. Is yeah. that it? Yeah. So when you speak about goals and ambitions, Lisa, mm -hmm. what are they? When you, when you had to dig deep and work out what do I want to achieve in the next 10 years? What did you set out for yourself? My, I've openly said for years that my um, main goal in my career wise is to achieve, you know, tours and arenas and, you know, in Nashville and around the world. And I want to spread my wings. Now, the last 10 years have been excuse me amazing don't get me wrong I have had a ball and I'm so proud of everything I've achieved and I've been a part of so far um, but a part of me kind of felt a bit boxed in um, where I had to do specific songs or I had to do them a certain way or I had to do them for other people 
and now I want to do the songs, my own songs that I've written, mm -hmm. and I don't have the reins on in the studio anymore. This is this is me, and I want to you know be on the stages that Kelsey Ballerini or Luke Combs or Maren Morris or you know all of the biggest American country artists are on. That's that's my goal, and mm -hmm. um, so I'm just. Still trying to find that way of getting so, there. So how do you go about it, Lisa? You know, because there's there's loads of people have ambitions and dreams and want to do things. So you've clearly had a brilliant career up until now, but you're trying to take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that physically and practically? Um, for me now, over the last kind of three years, well, three years ago, I'll take it back to where I went to a music conference in Cork mm -hmm. and I didn't tell anyone I was going. I just had in the back of my mind exactly what I wanted to achieve. So I was deter I'm a very determined person. Um, and I just jumped in the car and I went to this music conference. It was all about, you know, trying to break yourself in new territories mm -hmm. um, in Europe or further afield. And I thought, well, that's part of my plan. So I'm going to find out if, you know, how I can make that possible. So I went to the conference. There was different panels there and you know they opened them up to the floor and this particular panel was on about how you break Europe and how you achieve it and I was asking different questions and there was two men sitting to my right and after the panel was finished I was just sitting down writing my notes and this man closest to me turned around and he says who do you manage and I said um, myself really and he says, you manage yourself. And he says, what, why, why are you here? Like, where is your, your team? And, you know, what, why, what's your reason for being here? And I, I explained to him. And I think the fact that I was the only artist in the room that day, um, it was all, you know, label executives and producers and management teams. And he was very kind of surprised and pleasantly surprised I think he realised yeah yeah I think he was kind of taken aback and we we had more conversations over over the days after that and he kind of got to know me um, and one funny thing which I was really surprised at was that when we were having the conversation he says what's your name again and I says Lisa McHugh and he says Lisa McHugh and I says yeah and he says you're not going to believe this took his phone out and on his Spotify was some of my songs and he's like I, I literally have your songs on my phone he says I just didn't realize it was you um, anyway from that you know myself and Brian we got on really well and he knew he knows what my plans are um, I just to that point had been trying to navigate the way myself mm. um, and I always had the full end decision and I wasn't always necessarily sure if that was the right decision um, no one is but at the same time now I have a team behind me who are there to say we know what your goal is we're going to try our best to help you get there and introduce you to as many people as we possibly can out with you know the people that I already know in the industry and although you know that deep down this is what you want going to the next level playing stadia be it in in Ireland the UK right across Europe across the world Lisa mm -hmm. are you pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is that scary? You know, how does that feel for you to, to be doing that, even though deep down you know it's the right thing? There's still a risk involved. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying because, you know, I am not going to sit here and say that things are going really bad, you know, with what I was doing previously. They weren't. It was the opposite. Things were going incredibly well. And, you know, from the outside looking in, people would probably look at that and say, what are you doing? Like, why are you trying to... It's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Yeah. But in my gut, I just knew that I have so much more to, to give and musically, artistically, and, and also determination-wise, I just want to achieve so much. Um, and, you know, I don't... You know, no one knows if it's going to happen but at the same time I'm not going to give up trying yeah what's the point in living a life if you you know you're going to regret not trying absolutely yeah so tell me about the songwriting then Lisa and where has that come from have you always been writing songs or is this something you've decided to do since you took a break from the the dance gigs every weekend 
No, it's something I have always kind of dabbled in, to be mm -hmm. fair, I have. Um, I probably haven't taken it as seriously as I have over the last maybe five or six years. Um, and that's because the songs I was releasing up until that point, the majority of them were, were covers. And that just, that, that's what works in the Irish country scene. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that. You know, I had great success with the covers I, I released. And, Applejack. And I enjoyed it, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there comes a point where you, you want to actually tell your story. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. You know, I, I'd been writing songs up until that point, but I was a bit nervous you're almost showing everyone another layer of your vulnerability. And that's a big step as well. You know, the night before a song that you've wrote about a very personal experience coming out is a nervous night because you don't know, is it, everyone gonna love it as much as you do? You just hope. So is that your approach to songwriting in general? Is it semi-autobiographical in that way, Lisa? It's, it's not generic. You are pouring your own experiences into it to a degree. Absolutely. That's, that's what all of my songs are about. They, I want to be as honest as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the songs that I've written have been about personal experiences of my own or that I've went through um, during life. And each song kind of marks uh, a chapter or an event in, in my life. And, you know, the likes of... The scandal, for example, that I wrote whenever I stopped touring and everyone was kind of wondering if has she disappeared off the face of the earth and, and all these rumours kind of came came about and I decided, you know, I was going through that experience so let's just put pen to paper and write about it and You're Gonna Get Back Up as well is another song where I was feeling a bit deflated and I just needed that anthem, mm -hmm. you know, the encouragement song to, you know, just get back up and keep fighting. Um, watch me all about the times where I was told that it wasn't possible to achieve those dreams and you know it was harder for a woman and you're not gonna you know get the same respect or time of day as maybe you know the guy down the road mm -hmm. that everyone loves um, and I just you know I wanted to write that because I was like just watch me you know it's almost like me patting myself on the back saying give yourself the the determination to to make it happen where does this determination and confidence come from now i suppose i say confidence because from the outside looking and it looks like it's confidence there's a drive in you there's a fire in the belly lisa what fuels that um i don't know if i'm being completely honest i I suppose from a from a family background, my, my dad and my dad's always worked for himself, and he's a very ambitious um, man. And I I am I'm so lucky to have that you know background and support mm -hmm. from my parents and my family in general. And you know he he's often or him and my mum have often said to me, you know things aren't going to be handed to you on a plate. You have to work for them, and if you really want them, you know hopefully it'll work out the way you plan. But don't expect to be handed things and I've always kind of had that in the back of my mind where I knew like I was often told I had to fight for where I wanted to be I had to fight for those you know television performances radio performances to get the bit headline act I've had to stand up and you know try and be taken seriously um, and I suppose that you, you kind of learn to grow a thick skin after a, a, mm -hmm. a certain amount of time in in an in industry you say uh, in regard to the song watch me um that people would say it is more difficult for a woman in the music business in the country music business what has your experience been so far it is harder i'm not gonna sit here and say it's not because you know as, as i was saying there you, it, some promoters or some radio you know presenters or television producers or whatever the case may be a lot of the industry is male dominated um, and not only from the artist's point of view or the bands it's everyone mm -hmm. and in the hierarchy a lot of them are, are male and sometimes it takes a little bit longer for a female to actually be taken seriously now I'm not saying that not all females will be taken seriously. I'm just saying it does, well, for me personally, it, it took a little bit 
longer, <clears throat> excuse me, and I suppose it makes you want it more. It's made me want it more. It's made me want to prove the point more. And, you know, I, I just want to make sure everyone is getting their chance fairly mm -hmm. and not just um, the kind of first call being made to the first person who's always getting the first call. Mm. Um, because everyone deserves a fair chance. Everyone has something that they want to bring to the table and it might be something different to what the others are doing. But that doesn't mean to say it's bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're given that chance, you can then, that's your time to show, you know, improve your point. Um, but it's, it's all about getting that acceptance and welcoming and opportunity in the mm -hmm. first place. And you've, you've had that in abundance so far, Lisa. But as you say, some opportunities have just landed on your lap. Others you've had to fight for. Mm -hmm. And that's the nature of the business, isn't it? How important is social media in your world, Lisa? Uh, because we live in a world now where everyone has Instagram. Instagram is the account that you have to, to have to follow. You have tens of thousands of fans there following mm -hmm. your every move. Mm -hmm. um, what's your attitude to it? Um, <clears throat> social, I have a frog in my throat today. <laughs> <laughs> ribbit, so, ribbit. Yeah. <laughs> um, social media is an amazing thing um, in some ways mainly because you have instant contact with fans mm -hmm. and friends and you know it's so much more easy to access your favorite artist or your favorite song or promote something and it's for free you know there's there's no there's no better way than to capitalize on that and you're in control of it as well, to a degree, aren't you? Yes, yeah. I am. I'm on control, in control of, of my socials, and I suppose in, in some ways that it is, it's absolutely amazing. But in other ways, it can be very difficult mm. because sometimes it's fa it's hard to find the line where things are stopped, and that can come from how much you share, um, or it can come from how much is demanded, and sometimes it's it's hard to get that balance you know don't get me wrong i've i've been very lucky and and people are in, incredibly supportive of me but you do hear some stories of people that you know have negativity and mm -hmm. have you know horrible messages and and that's it's not what that's for you know everyone's just trying to their best mm -hmm. and i understand that when you're put on a pedestal or you're put in the spotlight that people are going to scrutinize you that's absolutely fine have your opinion, but you don't need to ram it down the person's throat, you know. It's the keyboard warrior thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah but no. But as I say, I've, I've been very, very lucky. Um, I suppose for me, I, I always share everything or as much as I possibly can with regards to my work and me personally. Um, there are parts of my life that no one knows about and no one needs to know about because, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's for me. I don't have to have everything, every single page opened in my book because I, I want some memories just for me as well. Yeah, and that must be really important to you just to maintain those boundaries. It is, it is really. And I've, I've learned a lot more over the years to, maybe not through my own, but from watching other people um, in the, the public eye mm -hmm. that have learned badly um, or have been hurt badly. So, you know, I just tend to share what I want to share and if, you, if you're not happy with that amount then I'm sorry but I can't give you any more. Well I think you seem to have a great relationship with your fans on social media and uh, one of the aspects of you, of Lisa, the person that mm -hmm. I love that you share is your sense of style and your clothes and your makeup and your hair. You know, obviously I'm sitting in awe today thinking, how did she get her hair so shiny like that without having to go to the hairdresser? You know, but I'm not alone. There'll be other, other women thinking exactly the same thing, Lisa. So why do you, why do you share things like that on social media? Um, I enjoy, I love clothes and I love fashion. Um, and I just, a lot of it is because I'm asked to. Mm -hmm. You know, people would send me messages and say, how did you do your makeup today? Or... What products did you use on your face? And I'm like, guys, I'm not a makeup artist. You know, I just whack it on and hope for the best. And I, I do be a bit nervous to show anything of, of that side of things. Not because I'm, I'm not saying that I'm the world's worst at doing makeup or hair, but 
at the same time, I'm not a hairdresser or I'm not a makeup yeah. artist. I'm not a stylist. I'm just me. And I just, you know, if I, if I like something online, like for example, this dress in Zara, I was like, oh, I'll buy that. And I'll, yeah. you know, I don't go out of my way to try and be this style icon. I would never see myself that as that either. Like, I just so don't, do you don't have a stylist? It. Stylist, do you get styled? No. Everything's no. you? Everything's me. So is you, it? Was it, whether it's here today or you walking out on stage for a particular event, you're the one coming up with the, the hair, the makeup and the, the clothes? Well, I do have help from my management team uh -huh. and Babs in particular. She's my little, she's just an angel and <laughs> she takes all my calls and she helps a massive amount with regards to styling and, you know, we would be back and forth. Um, all the time just different ideas but the majority of the time like it, for example if I was just doing everyday things then ov obviously then it's, it's just it's me. It's just you. Yeah. But how important is that backup in that regard you know when you're going to perform on a big stage say for example the New Year's Eve um, celebration in Dublin that was a massive gig. I imagine that worrying about clothes or worrying about how you're going to look on stage once that is settled and mm -hmm. it's put to bed it lets you focus on your job. Would I be right? Absolutely. Um, it's actually massive. And, you know, I know I've, I've said about my management team now and, and, and having that backing, but yeah. it's not only about music. You know, I felt like a lot of the time up until that, I was worrying about a million different things that I didn't necessarily have to, but I felt like I was in control, that it was my decision. Clothing, yeah. music, stage-wise, production, you know, hair, makeup, everything, you know, did everyone get paid? Who got paid this? All of that things were now, all of that's completely taken out of my hands and we're to the point where I feel so much more relaxed and I can just go and enjoy the show and perform and write the songs and that's what I'm there to do. I'm not there to worry about every other element that's going on around me and then I'll think about the music later. Like that's the it wrong order. It just allows that extra focus and that extra headspace to get on with the job at hand. Absolutely. And yeah. that is invaluable. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about songwriting to a degree. You've mentioned Nashville. You've mentioned how you love the Nashville sound at the minute, particularly the Marham Morrises and the Kelsey Ballerinis. Yeah. And we should say, when you have been songwriting in the last couple of years, Lisa, you've forged a number of great partnerships with Nashville songwriters. So the relationship with Nashville, it has been established. Yeah. So tell me about that. Nashville is the best place in the world. I mean, you know, you've been. It's class. It's amazing. And yeah. no, it doesn't, you don't actually have to be obsessed with country music like I am to enjoy Nashville as a place. Um, I've been very lucky to go quite a few times now. And the last couple of years I was at the CMA Festival, which is just a dream come true. You know, I'm standing there in the audience as a fan enjoying the shows of some of the biggest names in the world but also kind of <clears throat> looking around me and seeing how their shows are made you know production wise what songs they're singing are the songwriters in the room who their labels are and trying to network as well when I was there and I I worked very hard at that whenever I was there um, as well as writing songs and I have made some fantastic friends out of songwriting you know I just go into a session and I'm just an open book and I say exactly what it is that I'm going through sometimes I could be sitting there in tears trying to actually get out what it is that I'm feeling sometimes I'm elated and I'm like guys I can't wait to write about this everyone is different and um, I suppose for me it's been very important with regards to the sound of the songs um, and production wise, you know, I, I have a country voice. So no matter what song my voice is in, mm -hmm. it's still going to have that country element to it because I'm not going to change my voice at all. Um, and I suppose up until this point, the songs that I've released in the country, Irish country scene, they've been covers and they may not have been to the particular style that might be recognised as playable on like national stations, for mm -hmm. example, or television. And it's been difficult 
to get them to actually accept the fact that I have my own music now, I have my own sound and they're open to playing that now. Whenever we got our first playlisted song on the likes of 2FM or Today FM or Cool FM, it was a massive, massive deal because it never happened before. Crossover. It was, yeah. It felt like a real step for mm-hmm. me and, and our team. Um, the fact that they were not only welcoming me, but they were welcoming country music because I'm not doing this just for me. Mm-hmm. There's so many others in the, the Irish country scene that are so talented and they have so much more to give as well. Yeah. But sometimes it feels like people are like that. But some people would say that, you know, your new songs are a bit pop. They don't see them as country, Lisa. Yeah. Um, although you're sitting here telling me you love country, your voice is a country voice. Mm-hmm. The songs you're writing are country songs because you're pouring yourself into them like every good country song. There's a good story behind mm-hmm. every single song. Um, so wh- wh- how do you address that? Um, I'm, I wouldn't deny the fact that my songs now compared to what I was releasing before and what people are used to hearing mm-hmm. are a lot more progressive um, than they were then and I suppose my main concern is to grow my music and my brand and my career as much as I possibly can. So by getting the likes of a playlisted song on those huge stations it opens you to a, a much wider audience mm-hmm. in the hope that some of those might actually search the song and search the artist and, and become a fan. Um, and, you know, I, w- I wouldn't disagree with people who said, you know, your, 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 your sound has changed. It has changed. I'm never going to deny that, absolutely. But it's never going to ever be away from country. That is where I want to be. And because it doesn't sound like what it might have done maybe seven or eight years ago, it doesn't mean to say that I am going, I'm turning my back on what I've done so far or the fans that have literally have been phenomenal mm-hmm. from the word go so right up to this day. You know, they, they are absolutely, they've been phenomenal even since the new release of Country Mile or Watch Me or um, You're Gonna Get Back Up they are so encouraging and that makes me feel so much more at ease to know that they also understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. They're with you and they're enjoying the next chapter in the story of Lisa McHugh because that's exactly what it is and this time last year Lisa yeah that chapter had got off to the most phenomenal start um we're almost a year a year ago we had an inkling that something was coming our way Little did we know what exactly was going to happen and particularly how the music industry was going to be affected. So let's go back to um, New Year's Eve 2019, welcoming 2020. Where were you, what were you doing and what were you involved in on that New Year's Eve celebration? Oh my God, like I've actually got goosebumps (laughs) if you even mentioning that. New Year's Eve, I was in the middle of a Liffey on a stage performing at the biggest festival in the country. And it was a massive, massive pinch me moment for me. It's um, New Year's Eve, Dublin. You're Dublin. on the main stage. Main stage, performing my songs uh, alongside some of the biggest names in Ireland um, in the pop industry. And it was a real moment for me and my team because I felt similar to the radio playlist. I felt like we were being given an opportunity and people were being open and welcoming mm-hmm. to country. Mm-hmm where that had never happened before on the New Year's Eve festival and I I was so proud I really was I was so proud and it was the start of an amazing year ahead for us you know I had the likes of Country to Country in London I had um, Kaleidoscope I had Electric Picnic I was supposed to be supporting Tom Jones and had all these amazing things planned and we were ready to go like from New Year's Eve I was I was like a coil spring, ready to go. And then the 13th of March comes and we're told that the Country to Country Festival is cancelled because of COVID. And I was I was absolutely devastated, you know, I was. And it was it was the first of many swipes that were taken. Um mm. because then it was just the domino effect. And to the point where any time my manager was ringing me, I was just almost like, I'm not even gonna answer that because I know what's coming. 
um, and it was a tough pill to swallow because we had worked so hard to get you know this far mm. um, and to to get our foot on the stage and actually be able to perform at something we'd never done before and for all that just to be swiped from under you it was it was very tough so how did you deal with it um I had my frustration days, don't mm. get me wrong, I, I was, I, I was disappointed. I also really turned heavily to exercise and trying to focus on the positives because let's be honest, I am incredibly lucky. I have, I'm healthy, my family and friends are healthy. We've come out, which I hope is the end of this pandemic with everyone around me still healthy and happy and I have a roof over my head, I have food to eat and I, you know, I am hopefully confident that those things will be rescheduled and we'll get the opportunity. I honestly really, really hope that we still get the chance to do those things, um, whether that's next year or a little further down the line. So as much as it was hard at the time, I still very much, I'm a positive person and I always try and look at the positives out of it and be thankful and grateful for what I actually do have. And you still have the songs in the can. They're all still there. You have been releasing songs as we go along. You're you're kind of teasing us towards the album, Lisa. So mm -hmm. we've had a few releases up until now. You've mentioned uh, three of the songs so far. And we have another release imminent. So tell me about your new song. Ah, I know. I'm so excited. Um, it's called Bad Idea, but it's a good idea. <laughs> Um, I wrote this song um, a couple of years ago actually and I wrote it with two of my friends in Nashville. It was literally just before I was about to head to the airport to come home from that trip. And the night before obviously was my last night in town and we had a great couple of weeks with the girls and decided to go out and have a girly night out in Nashville. And one of the girls just so happened to find herself a bad boy and we were like, oh, you know, watching from the outside, looking in, this is a bad idea. But it was such a great idea to write a song about because the next day we were having breakfast and I was like, we have to write about last night, we have to. And bad idea happened and it's literally there, about to be released. Oh my goodness. So how do you feel? What What's that sensation like whenever you've worked on a song? Uh, you feel like you do. Obviously, you're very, very excited about this song particularly. Um, and you know that it's going to be released to the public very shortly. It's going to be on the radio. Um, what are the nerves like? How do you manage that? I have butterflies right now. <laughs> I actually do. I have butterflies. And it's a real, it's a, it's a real roller coaster of emotions because I'm, I'm obviously very excited to release the song, but you still have that little bit of nervous in you because... It's a brand new song, it's another one you've written, it's another one about a, an experience and it's another one that you really hope everyone's going to enjoy and you know like as much as you do. It's a real upbeat one, it's a fun one and yeah the title might be Bad Idea but it really is a good idea. It's going to connect, that's the dream. I hope so, I really really hope so, I do, I really hope so. Well we will have to see Lisa and finally we're now uh, two months into 2021. Are you even daring to plan anything for the rest of the year? Or how are you, what is your outlook on things from now on with the uncertainty that's all around us? Um, I'm a mixed bag because we've had to reschedule a lot and it's been, like everyone else, everyone else has got their hopes up and, and thinking that they're they're out the other side and like things are going to get back to normal and the following week we're back in lockdown again or it's going to be so much longer before we're out of it and you're getting disappointed again. So of course I'm very excited at the prospect of, of being out of this and be back to normality very mm. soon. Um, in the meantime, I do think that we will just be concentrating on releasing new music and I'll get that album out hopefully before the end of this year and then when things are normal and we're able and allowed to do our job 
fully and properly, I'll be back on that stage as quickly as you can say go. <laughs> and we'll be singing the songs back at you, Lisa. Oh, I hope so. And singing them along with you, absolutely. Really we will. So. Never a bad idea to have a chat with you, Lisa McHugh. Thank you. Thanks for your time today and all the best with your new release, Bad Idea. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> it's over, breathe. I know, I can breathe. <laughs>